Well, we live in a country where we cherish our freedoms, right? And pretty soon we'll get to exercise one of our freedoms, and that is going to the ballot box and, and voting. But the freedoms are, in America, are like, unlike any others in other, any other country. We live and travel where we want and when we want. We can financially support or publicly criticize whoever we want. We eat and drink and even smoke what we want. No civilization in the world or in any time in history has experienced as much freedom as we have right now in America. People from other parts of the world can only dream of the freedoms that we have and that we experience every day. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why they're clamoring to get into our country, because they want to partake in that. And yet some might say that all this freedom, sometimes as Americans, it goes to our heads. And that sometimes might lead to a serious problem. They believe sometimes that too much freedom by the people may lead to chaos, may lead to um, confusion and anarchy. Look at some of the current debates that surround, that, that are in our country. Could be about gun control, could be about abortion, could be about the open borders. And the remedy, some believe, is that is a formation of new laws. Let's, let's make new laws. They say people need to be regulated and restricted so they won't do harm to themselves or to one another or to the innocent. Some applaud the passing of new laws that restrict. Others protest and say, you're infringing on my, my personal rights, my personal freedoms. And my question today is, how can, well, we know there's like 300 and some million people in America, right? How can there be such a wide disparity in people's viewpoints? Well, probably because there's so, a, such a large number of people. They find themselves on all different uh, points on the spectrum of the viewpoint. What's the answer to these ongoing debates? I'm not sure, I'm not here to exactly say that, but, but one question could ask, should more laws be created to curb people's freedoms, thereby helping them protect themselves, help them protect from themselves or, or from others? Or should the citizens of this country be free to make decisions without, you know, they always say government interference? Perhaps more laws help guard the freedom people have already gained. Others would argue that more laws, again, are an infringement on what, on their freedoms. Unsurprisingly, the answer is not an easy one, and it's a debate that continues to go on through the government and through just public dis discourse. But why, my, so that's not surprising, but what might surprise you is that in the book of Philippians, there's actually says something about this subject, about restraints versus freedom. When we read Philippians, and when I've read Philippians, the more I'm convinced that this short little letter that was sent out by Paul to the Philippian church way back in 50 AD, around 55 to 60 AD, by the Apostle Paul, um, he speaks to our current dilemma. That's an ongoing debate. What's better for society? More restraints, less restraints. In the past when I've read Philippians, usually the thing I take away from Philippians right away is joy. There's joy and there's thanksgiving in Philippians. Listen to Paul's opening remarks. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy. There's nothing that warms a pastor's heart more than thinking about his congregation and I have joy, we have joy for, for those who are in, who are in the, who are fighting with me in the, in the prospect of advancing the gospel, the goal of advancing the gospel. And that single statement alone, the idea that when I think of you, I have joy, that is practically worth, the, that's the, uh, the great, that's worth the entire book right there practically. 
because there's no better medicine for us than to think of our family and friends and our parishioners and be thankful for them. They're in the trenches with me. You're in the trenches with me. Lily and Casey and Natalie, they're over at the school sharing the light of the truth of the gospel. That brings me joy. Llewellyn on her Saturday morning with the, with the high school kids and the junior high kids and whoever shows up, that brings me joy. Blake up in the helping with the high schoolers. And that goes for everybody here. You are out there in the front lines just as Paul was saying to the Church of the Philippians. But even more important than joy is the fact that my fellow church goers and brothers, we are, we are in it because of God's grace. That's why we take up the mantle and we, and, we, and we do this. God's grace is shared by each of us. Paul says right there in Philippians, all of you share in God's grace with me. That's why we do what we do. And this fact alone should cause me to treat you people and my neighbors and my co-workers and my family with love and respect because we share in God's grace together. The Bible tells us that God loves us so fervently, so unreservedly, that grace, something we do not deserve, is ours simply by the asking. We just ask God and believe in God's Son and we we receive God's grace. Being Christ's follower, I should likewise try to extend that grace to my fellow man, and especially those who claim, claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. There's a special connection, isn't there, with, people, with the family of God. But you might ask yourself, how does that relate to my initial idea, my, my initial thesis, that is more restraint or less restraint? Put it simp putting it simply, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians that restraints are actually good for the saints, or at least good for the advancement of the gospel, for the kingdom of God, that restraints are actually good. Re remember, recall what John read in the scriptures this morning. He said, what has happened to me, this is what Paul writes, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. In other words, what, what, what has happened to him? Paul is in jail. He's in chains. He's been, he's been put in jail for preaching, preaching about Christ and his resurrection, his death and resurrection. And the new life you can have by following him. This is why he is in jail. This is why he has chains. Restraints are good for the saints because they can, what does it say? Serve to advance the gospel. To be honest, this principle is something that our Western society does not typically like to hear about because when we think about restraints and regulations, we think about uh, negative conditions in our lives. And, being, and I admit, being, in, being incarcerated and being in jail and being in chains, that is a negative condition. I, would not want, I don't know about you, but I sure wouldn't want to be in chains or in, under house arrest. You see, in America, we savor and bask in the glory of knowing what we, we can do what we want to do when we want without anybody looking over our shoulder to see who's watching. We like that about America. And when somebody threatens maybe our personal, personal rights and freedoms, we say, you know, look out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight. We like knowing that we can go to the grocery store and buy up a year's supply of toilet paper if we want. We can do that. We enjoy the fact that we can go to pay one price and go and eat as much food as we want at the buffet at Golden Corral. If we want to do that, we can do that. We can take comfort in the fact that, you know, if I don't like my doctor, if I don't like my minister, I can go somewhere else. I can go to the next doctor office down the street. I can go to the next church down the street if I want. We like to go to church and we sing the song, my chains fell off. Because what? Why? Because chains are bad. Of course, in that thing, they're talking about your sins and the burdens of life. But 
but you know what I'm getting at here. Chains inhibit and restrict our freedom. Chains limit my mo movement and my, ultimately my choices. And I'm an American, I like my choices. It seems, well, Paul's in chains, right? And I get the feeling he's not happy about it. He would rather be visiting the people of the Philippian church. He'd rather be being with those he cares for and loves and is affectionate for. And so he writes, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He doesn't want to be under house arrest. But he can't, and he can't go see them now like he wants to. He may never see them again. He's going to go on to Rome and but right now his movements are hindered. He's under the watchful eye of the Roman government. Um, more than that, he's restrained and he's a prisoner of the civil authorities. This cannot be good. But Paul says it is good because it's advancing the gospel. And that's the most important thing for Paul. Paul writes, as a result of my imprisonment and my persecution, this circumstance has been, that has been my lot, it has become clear throughout the whole palace and to everyone else that I am in chains for one reason, and that is for Christ. In other words, anyone who knows my situation there, anybody who's in the civil government in Rome, and they've heard why he's there, he's in there because he preached Christ, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. That is one awesome testimony. When they know that person, that's the reason. Because, you know, when people are in prison, they go, what's he in for? That's the first thing we ask if we find out someone's in jail. It's like, what did he do? But when they talk about Paul, they say, he preached the gospel. What do, what do you think people say about you when you come to their mind? What, what, do, you, what do you think? You ever, ever speculate that? When, what, how, what, what do people think about me when they, what do they say about me when they think about me? Oh, there goes that crotchety old football coach. Uh, Gary, you're not crotchety though, you're, you're awesome. There's that weird teacher, there's that stuffy banker, there's that rough construction worker, there's that arrogant blowhard preacher, there's that self-absorbed, self-righteous neighbor that never would talk to me. You see, we're, the point is we, we all, we send out vibes and signals to others that may well be misinterpreted. But the essential question for us Christians is, is Christ exalted in our words and our deeds? And when they think about you, do they think, there's the person that stands up for Christ? There's a person who tries to live out his faith. Is this the message, is this the message we're sending to the world? This is the message Paul is sending to the world while he is restrained, even because he is restrained. Paul's restraints are serving to advance the gospel for one reason, and this is the reason why he can do this. Why he advances the gospel, it's simply this, because he is free on the inside. On the inside, he is free. His heart is full, full, so full of joy and love and hope and affection and prayers, and this makes all the difference in the world. Because when trial comes, gets us, when trials come into our lives, and it may be a health, it might be, you know, running with a law, it might be, you know, a, a falling out with a, your family member or things like that, different trials or come in, maybe we, we lose our job for some reason. When those things happen, our true colors are revealed. Our true colors of our soul are revealed. That's probably why a lot of times when something happens in our lives, our tendency is want to isolate ourselves from the family of God. We, we, we like we, oh man, I don't, I really can't be with them right now because maybe they won't accept my shortcomings, my flaws, what I'm going through, my frailties. They're, they're revealed, they're out there, they're exposed, and people, but then we, and we quickly forget Paul's words, and that is, all of you share in God's grace with me. 
And that means that at some point that we receive God's grace, at some point we receive God's grace, you know what that also means? That at some point in our life, we confess our shortcomings and our failures and our frailties and our sins. We've confessed those to God because that's the only way we're going to get God's grace is when we go before him humbly and acknowledge and say, God, I, I can't do this on myself. I can't do this. I need your love. I need your mercy. I need your grace. I'm a, I'm a broken person. I need you to, to heal me and to make me whole. The saints in Philippi and the saints in Elmont, well, we won't be surprised. We won't be surprised by, by the burdens you have. We're all in this together. We all share in God's grace together. That's why we're called to dispense God's grace to one another. He's freely shared with us. We freely share with one another. But let's go back to my original question. Restraints and limitations, are they good or bad for us? Paul has already spoken of one type of restraint in that he is in prison, but he says that, is to serve, that actually advances the gospel. He says, everyone knows why I'm in chains. But let's not overlook this idea, and that is that our physical bodies, they can be our limitation. The older we get, the more we can relate with this. Yesterday, I was just thinking, oh, I'm having some, feels like some heartburn. Uh, I remember having that feeling 10 years ago when I had to go in and get a stent put in my heart. I said, oh, gee, I hope that's not happening again. I hope it's just the bad food I eat or something like that. But, you know, we have our... We have our physical frailties, I guess you say. But in verse 21, we read about what is probably one of the most radical statements in all the Bible, written by Paul. He says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That means I'd rather be with Christ than to be here with you people. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Paul, at the time of this writing, he's probably had been preaching and, and, and evangelizing and going around to these different communities for 20 and 30 years. Church planting and teaching. And he says to them, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which would be far better than to be here with you folks. <laughs> Boy, I bet they got a chuckle out of that. But Paul is unable to go. He says, why? I can't go, though. I want, this is what I want to do, but I can't, because why? I need to be here to make sure you folks get to maturity. It is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So he stays out of love, love for God's mission, love for God's people. Paul is restrained from doing what he really wants to do because of love. Not just love, well, not just love for the people, love for God himself and his mission. Because God loves these people, and his desire is that, they, that these Christians be made, come to completeness. I will continue with you, he says, Paul says, for your progress and for your joy in the faith. Do you see this unfolding in your life? Do you see your life so inextricably linked to others that your absence would actually cause great, a great void in their lives? What if all of a sudden Llewellyn could not attend a Sunday school? What a great void that would be for all those children who huddle around her every Sunday morning to learn from her. It is a poignant and powerful reminder that each member of the body of Christ is so vital, so integral to the whole. So much so that we are actually restrained by our decisions. For example, our Sunday morning decisions. Sure, we like to stay home and watch all-star wrestling. Or maybe we watch Dr. Stanley on the TV. He preaches such wonderful sermons, Dr. Stanley. But we soberly understand that that the absence from the body brings really no earthly good to our family, to God's family. So we lay our aside those things that we like to do, maybe go fishing, maybe do whatever, go duck hunting, things like that. I saw the, 
the geese flying over today. Somebody must have been shooting down south here because they're all flying north. You see, we restrain ourselves and our decisions sometimes so that the community of believers and those outside watching the community of believers, they say, my, look how they love each other. And then the gospel is advanced. Restraints actually can be a good thing. And the greatest restraint, Paul says, is love itself. That is but pastor, I thought love was what makes everyone more free. And in a real sense, yes, because when love restrains us, God's love can be seen in us and through us. When love restrains us. When we show patience and we show kindness to one another, when we're slow to anger, when we do not demonstrate envy and, and we're not boastful, and when we forgive and rejoice in the truth, these are the things from 1 Corinthians 13. You're probably recognizing this. When we are restrained by love, love is free to work in us, and then God's love is shown through us. Are restrictions and restraints good for society? The answer is yes. When the source of those restraints is love. After all, when you think about society, what is society? Society is is an extension of a family, in a sense. Wasn't all humanity formed out of one family? Did not God establish way back in Deuteronomy the principle that the family is the central clearinghouse of God's laws, which are based on love? Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's from way back in Deuteronomy. These commandments I give you today, that, that they would be put upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. Yes, those are laws, God's laws, but they are based, the, the fundamental, at the base, at the foundation of that is love. I share an analogy of this idea of restraints and freedom with you. There was, and a couple of you people out here might remember, the, remember it, but they went on vacation to the rugged Central American terrain, and they used the zip lines to see over the terrain. They had never done anything like that before, and suffice it to say, they, they were a bit nervous about doing it, but they wanted to do it because they didn't want to go home and regret the fact that they had the opportunity, but they didn't do it. And wow, they were glad they did. One expressed the most thrilling part of the ride was being in the harness, being in the restraint, and, but not having to use their hands or their feet. They could just feel the freedom of going of, of, on that ride. They described how exhilarating that feeling was. Perhaps this can be a reminder to all of us that the restraints of God that, that are put on us in love, they do help us ex fully experience freedom. The freedom that we've really come to yearn for and we want and which God, God desires for each of us. Because again, God's love of restraint um, helps us love one another. Maybe this is what Jesus meant when he said in John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus said this in the context of believers being members of God's family. And when you think about it, God's family, that's the garden where the love grows up. A love that grows in us. A love that grows in us also restrains us so that we can bring the freedom of Christ to others. Amen.